you're graduating, don't sign up. Yeah. Did you do it? Any of you graduating this time around? Okay. I thought we'd already settled that in. Graduation applications were due last week, but you might still get it in. Okay, absolutely. So, a long, long time ago in the classroom, not very far away from here. Uh, we finished last time, where we started, okay, last week, we had to test, but before that we were talking about the supply costs, fixed costs, variable costs, marginal costs, all that kind of stuff. Um, and we're thinking in the role of a producer. You're trying to make something and sell it and make money from it. And these next few chapters that we're going to, get, going to get into is there's different types of different types of industries that you can be competing in when you play, when you're participating, when, when you are producing and selling what it is you're producing and selling. The comp competitive atmosphere might be different for one type of business than another type of business. If you're monopoly, what is the competitive situation? You have no competitors, right? But what about if you're a farmer? How many other farmers are there out there? Millions. So it's a different set of rules, right? So that's what we're going to be getting into for these next, I don't know, three weeks. We're going to be looking at these four basic types of markets. And we're going to look at the different rules that apply in each market because one farmer out of a million cannot behave the same as a company like Microsoft, right? You can't, be, you can't behave the same, you can't act the same, because it's a whole different game. You can't just like a football player can't slam dunk, well, they're not supposed to slam dunk, kind of thing. Um, a soccer player is not supposed to use their hands, right? You know, a football player, it's different rules, different game. So this chapter, this module here, pure competition, this is sort of a mashup of two chapters from the old textbook that I used to use, but there really is only, some textbooks, they put this stuff together, some of it, they manage to break it apart, and I just sort of put it together. There we go. So if you are bored and start reading chapter eight of the textbook, some of what we're going to be talking about may not be in there quite right. But the missing chapter title is Profit Maximization. Maximization. What's the word maximization? The highest. Maximize, which is the highest you can get. So profit maximization, we talked about this at the beginning of the semester. Why your business is in business? To make profit. And how much profit? The most profit possible. So there is a set of basic rules that applies to everybody. A one in a million farmer is trying to make the most profit possible. Microsoft is trying to make the most profit possible. Right. So there are some things that are similar. But in order to talk about it, we have to have some kind of framework. So generally, the textbooks end up talking about it in terms of talking about pure competition. So when we talk about the profit maximizing chapter, we end up talking about pure competition anyway. So that's why I mentioned them all together. So just enjoy the ride for the next little bit. But some of the stuff that we're going to talk about is going to apply to the other industries as well. But first, why are why businesses in business? To make the owners profit. That is the number one reason why people start their own business. Make extra money. And if the business ain't making you extra money, you ain't gonna do it. If Sam could make more money working at Burger King than he could doing the whatever Uber delivery thing things he was doing a couple weeks ago in class, he ain't gonna do the Uber deliveries. So if he can make more money doing Uber deliveries than he could working at Burger King, yeah. He'll let somebody else have it there way and he's gonna be driving his car. So, um, it's reminding me of something very King and you remember what it is now. But profit, as we all know, especially from last week, two weeks ago, profit is the difference between total revenue and total costs. Take your total revenue, price times quantity, how much money did you bring in, subtract out all your costs, and then if you had anything left over, that's profit. Now, why do we do this? Why do you start a business? Uh, and I sort of Edited this. Maybe I should edit the slide first. Why would you start your own business? Why would you start farming, start chicken assassinating, whatever, cook, baking cakes, baking cookies, doing Uber deliveries, whatever the work is there? First is expected profit. 
do you know when you can start a business that you are going to make a profit? No, you don't know. You just take it a guess. And hopefully, it's the best guess that you can. And you do any market research, you do any homework, and you got a pretty good idea about what things are. Did we talk about that movie? Jiggling? Yeah. Yeah. Don't watch it. Yeah, don't watch it. And but just you know, they thought they were going to make a bunch of money, and that's why they did it. They didn't realize that they were only going to bring in five million dollars worth of ticket sales after spending like thirty or forty million. Then they had to run after that. So, expected profit, social status. Some people run their own business because they want to be able to walk around town saying, "I run my own business. I am my own boss. Look at me, I'm important." I mean, the, that might not be the main reason, that might not be the only reason, but that is a factor that goes into it. You know, not only am I going to make some extra profit, but I'm going to, you know, people are going to look at me and respect me for once in my life. I don't know. Some people have flexible hours. I get to set my own hours. If I don't feel like working today, I don't work today. Maybe you get yourself set up with whatever your business that you have that power. There are some people that are like really control freaks. They want heavy what? It's not just that. People like a sense of control. They like to control their destiny, control what's going on in their lives and in their business. And that actually happens. I, it just sort of occurred to me the um, couple of the guys that I used to do construction work with, like I told you, they were all family. They were the boss, several of his sons, a couple of his nephews. But the couple of the nephews. William and, well, especially William, he decided, well, instead of me working for JJ, doing all this work for JJ, who's getting a profit? JJ. I'm doing the work, but he's getting a profit. Well, and I like to be in control because I got my idea about how to do, I think things should be done. William said, I'm going to go out and start my own career. And his brother Stephen said, I'm going to go with him. So then, of course, so then now uh, they're William Wells contractor, as opposed to the Peter's contractor. So he did two separate business. And of course, William and Stephen are arguing all the same time about how to do things. But so Stephen is no longer working for William. He's kind of gone out on his own because he's got control, because he's got his ideas about how to do things. It happens. But there are some people that the reason why they do what they're doing is out of some kind of sense of mission or purpose or trying to do some greater calling. Think about anybody that started any nonprofit business, like hospitals, uh, animal shelters. You know, they're doing that for some reason other than money. So that's the reason why somebody would start their own business. But, okay, I already talked about this. The goal for the for-profit firm is to make the most profit possible. To maximize your computer screen is to pick up the entire screen. That's what I'm doing with these slides here. To maximize the profit, get as much as you can. But you have to recognize every cost that you have as an opportunity. Cost. If you decide to, I'm going to buy a new computer, I'm going to buy a new chainsaw, I'm going to buy a new truck, well, the question is, what could you have done with that money instead? You don't invest in the equipment, and that money would have been profit that you could use to get an even larger TV. But if you decide to buy that equipment, well, you ain't getting a TV. If you decide to get the TV, then you don't get the equipment. There's opportunity costs that you can think about. So the idea of economic profit. Same just regular profit. This is total revenue minus total economic profits. I mean, minus by the English, minus total economic costs. Because what we saw last time, two weeks ago, is we were just subtracting our fixed costs and variable costs, right? But there are other costs, and that's what I have labeled here as direct costs. How much are you spending for your land, your buildings, your greetings, chainsaws, your labor, your electricity? But an economist is going to say, we got to remember the opportunity cost. What are you giving up? What are you not doing in order to do this? You're giving up the joy of having a big screen TV when you're deciding to buy the chainsaw instead. You're giving up the joy of going to Virginia Tech when you decide to go to UK instead. And you need to factor that in because that's part of your sacrifice, part of what's going on there. And then there's the cost of debt. You're going to buy a $50,000 building, but then you're going to borrow money for it, and you're going to pay $10,000 worth of interest, and it's that $50,000 building ended up costing you $60,000. You need to factor that one in there as well. It's not just the price tag you pay, but what are all of the costs that are involved with that equipment as well. So 
once you put all of that together, right, the legitimately financial, the legitimate costs, and then the psychological costs in there too. You know, I talk about this all every time we talk about it. Think about you stress involved and everything. That's when you find out are you making a profit. Not only am I making the same, making more money doing the Ubering than he did working at Burger King, but he's also, yeah, he's got the stress of, well, what happens if my money's up and down and up and down? So his blood pressure's a little bit higher, but he's getting rewarded enough. He's like, I'm okay getting the higher blood pressure. That would be total, that would be economic profit that he's in. But of course, you know, there is no guarantee of profit. So the greater the chance that you're not going to make a profit, the only way that you're going to take that swing to the bat is if there is a pretty good chance that you're going to get a big amount of money. You lend me $100, what are the odds I'm going to pay you back? 50-50, any of you lend me money? No. You give the lottery commission a uh, hundred dollars worth of you buy a hundred dollars worth of tickets. What are the odds you win two hundred seventy-two million in the lottery? One out of two. Pretty yeah, pretty ridiculous. It, it ain't happening. But why do people buy those lottery tickets? High reward. Okay, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna get it, but if I do get it, I'm gonna get two hundred seventy-two million or whatever it was I said. Finally, the two whoever went to South Carolina is that one won that one and a half. Billion few back in the fall finally came forward and got the money because they were like hesitating because they're like, I don't want it, my name out there. And yeah, and so yeah, it just ended up. That's the sort of mind boggling thing. Like, I've got 1.5 billion dollars that I'm not going to get six months. So, so. What was that? Where's the thing now? You know, spending it within two months. Yeah. And then think of what would happen if whoever that was, they, I don't know, they had collected their winnings and now they got hit by a truck or something like that. Nothing. Never claimed it. Nothing. So, okay. But, um, we talked about lending money to people, and y'all were willing to lend to Dr. Robert or Bill Gates at lower interest rate than you were willing to lend it to me. So why would what what would have to happen for me to get you to take the risk of lending it to me, who's a greater flight risk to Bill Gates? Because I'm gonna pay you a higher interest rate. Yeah, Bill was only gonna pay you one percent, I'm gonna pay you five percent, you're like, okay, well suddenly that's worth it. That's it's worth taking the risk because I'm because the payoff was there. Um, this happens when you're thinking about starting a business or starting starting to produce something new. Is you start looking at the how risky is it, and then you got to weigh that into what is that payoff going to be. So, as a sort of setting stage for what I was saying in the beginning, there are different markets. Those markets have different characteristics, and that defines. What kind of market you're in, it defines the kind of game that you're in. Think basketball, football, soccer, baseball. There's some similarities there, right? You're all using the ball, right? And most of you, well, and you're using clean cell for them, I guess. No, not in basketball. So, okay. So, okay, you're using the ball, so the, and, and there's a clock, okay? And then there's some kind of referee type person, right? So there are some similarities, but there's difference. You're kicking the ball in soccer. You're not kicking the ball in basketball. You're touching the ball in basketball and football and baseball, but you're not touching the ball in soccer, right? There's similarities and differences here. And those differences for business, we define them in these three characteristics. Number one, how many people are there in the game? How many people are you competing against? A few people, a bunch of people. That's gonna help define what you do. How easy is it for somebody else to get into the business or get out of the business? And the third one is, root word of differentiation is what? Different. How different are the products from one another? Are they very similar, very, very, very similar, or is there nothing anywhere near like it? 
That's going to help define what kind of industry you're in. So these three, question on the test, hint, hint, point, point, that's that. These three characteristics will be defining your industry. And I'm going to give you a very broad, fresh, 10,000 foot overview right here. That we're going to be, we're going to have a separate chapter on each of these coming up. Perfect competition. You have many, many, many competitors. It is relatively easy to do. And a product is standardized. Everybody's basically making basically the exact same thing. The example here is farming. The soybeans that carry his family and produce are the same soybeans that Tristan and well, he's in another class of guy Tristan and his family produce. They're like number two soy number two, number two soybeans. And so they produce number two soybeans, they produce number two soybeans, and these soybeans are both getting delivered to to give. Yo, y'all take y'all to North Carolina, all right? Yeah. Uh, you, you you figure out remember the name of the place? I don't know where it's in Rocky Mountain. Okay. So they, they're taking theirs to a place to Rocky Mountain. Tristan and family may be taking theirs to Rocky Mountain. What do they do? They dump it in the same bin and it's going to get mixed together and do the same thing. Uh, corn farmers, you know, they may take their trucks loads of corn and take it to Kellogg's or Kellogg's and turn it into cornflakes. And if you bring yellow corn number two, I'm bringing yellow corn number two. Somebody else bring yellow corn number two. We're all bringing yellow corn number two. What happens if somebody were up with a truckload of purple corn? Kellogg's is going to say what? No thanks because our corn flakes are supposed to be golden yellow, not purple. Right. So everybody is baking, making the same product. There's very many people, and it's relatively easy to do. I ain't saying farming is easy in anybody, too, but it's pretty easy. Because can any of y'all can y'all like grow some corn in your backyard? Maybe not all of them. Yeah, y'all do. Can y'all grow some watermelon? Yeah, y'all have garden hose the ability to spit, so you buy one more melon, you got enough seeds to grow some more. Right. It just you may not need a whole lot of specialized equipment. The bigger you get, the more specialized equipment you need to get as far as tractors, combines, and that kind of stuff, but you can start small. So it's relatively easy to do. And think about how many million, millions of farmers there are in the United States. No, they're spread out. To the south and the Midwest and out west, yeah, all over the place. Um, I'm sitting here trying to do the math in my head, and we're, we've got over four million farmers in the United States. So, what, like, what percent of the land do only farmers own in America? That's a lot. Of, that's a lot of farms. Yes. Uh, I actually. I have those numbers somewhere in my office. I have them somewhere on my own. Don't worry, probably. I know like some corporations own the land, and then they hire farmers to farm for them. Yeah, and, uh, and as if you end up looking at uh, ninety, probably I'd say ninety percent of the farms are small family farms that bring in bring in revenue less than fifty thousand dollars a year. That's revenue. That ain't profit. Yeah. So then you should track out your costs of doing things. Your profit maybe. To, to feed their family may only be five, ten thousand dollars a year. But that's like ninety percent of the farms out here. But then there's a handful of farms out there that are huge corporate whatever that just they do millions of dollars worth of business here. Uh, but there are some instances where there are some companies, well, we own some land and well this just we don't we we got this land and we're not we're not using it at the moment, so we'll pay somebody to come in farm it or something, do something with it while we're there, make a little bit of money. Rent it out to farmer, maybe we'll. Kind of like a, I'm saying like a, like a milk company will have like their own like dairy farms, but they hire farmers to farm for them. Well, um, like a farmer, they only farm for a certain company. Yeah, well, the the, the farmers are independent farmers; they just subcontract it out. Um. If they do that with dairies, the farmers said they'll have an exclusive contract. We're going to deliver our milk to them. Chickens, a lot of the, them, the, you have a chicken house. A lot of it's like Tyson, in other words. Uh, Tyson, they'll like bring in the baby chicks, 
you know, you buy them, they bring them in, and they you, you put them in your chicken house, and then they come back like eight months, eight weeks. We'll go with eight weeks. That sounds about right. They'll come back eight weeks later and they'll get up every one of those now grown chickens and put them in, take them in the trucks, haul them off, and then you've got a few weeks to clean up, eight weeks for chicken coop out of your chicken house. And y'all see these chicken houses there, like twice the length of this building and twice the width of this classroom. And big fans and stuff. I've had several of them on our way to beach and hike this whole week. But just, but they, they're, they're, they're just a contract thing to the farmers or independent farmers. So, monopolistic, well, let me turn back here to pause. Monopoly. Besides that game that you used to hate playing when you were a kid, because you used to beat your older brother in the game and then your older brother would beat you as a result, so you never actually finished the game with Monopoly in your life. All right. Anybody else besides me? But Monopoly, what is that? Mono. The kissing busy time. Oh, Mono, one, right? Oh, there's only one person doing it, and part of the reason why there's only one person doing it is it's very hard to do what it is that you're doing. And there's nobody that's doing anything like it. But if there's somebody else is doing something similar to it, well, then they're competing. But there's nothing that's, nothing that's close to it, and it's hard to do what you're doing, so you're it. You're, that's a monopoly. An oligopoly, or duopoly, duo is what? Two. Oligopoly is few. Oligopoly, sure. Y'all heard of oligarchs? Oligarchies, that's when you have a few powerful people that are running the government kind of thing. Well, oligopoly, a few businesses running the industry. A few or two, in this situation you have a few businesses, more than one, but there's very few because it is still pretty hard to do what they're doing. The products are standardized and differentiated at the same time. Example here, let's go with automobiles. Just cars. The auto industry. How how easy is it to make a car? It ain't easy, right? It's expensive, a whole lot of machines, big huge buildings, and all that kind of stuff. It's hard to be manufacturing cars. Cars, can you tell the difference between the Ford and the Chevy? Between the Honda and the Toyota? Yeah. But they both have they all have four wheels. Gas pedal on right, brake pedal on left, steering wheel, sitting on the left, airbags coming out of the stick, thing, seat belts. 80% you know, of the cars are basically the same thing. 90% of the same thing. It's just how it's shaped and how weird it's the little controls to work the radio and that kind of stuff, right? So they're similar but different. And the differences are kind of important. Not super important, but kind of important. So they're standardized but differentiated. Oh, yeah. hmm? oh, yeah. Well, a, a truck, a four wheel drive, two wheel drive, but it's still it's basically the same thing. Yeah, that's the beginning of the category. So, our uh, last group, monopolistic competition. Monopolistic, what are we going to do? Monopoly, right? But competition. Monopolistic competition is a blend of pure competition and monopoly. Because what you get here is there are many people doing what you're doing, but what they're doing is fairly easy to do, but the products are different. So it's like having one of each type of business in town. Kind of an only one. Uh, the example that I use, my favorite, is restaurants. It ain't that hard to run a restaurant. How many restaurants do we have in South Hill alone? 30? Probably not a bad guess. There's 30 of them in South Hill. It's relatively easy to do because all you need to do, you need to know how to cook and find several buildings, got some tables, chairs, and ovens, and refrigerator, you're there. Right? But is there differences between the food that Applebee serves and the food that Bojangles serves? Is there differences in the quality of service you get at Brian Steakhouse versus K Hills? Is there differences in portion control, the size of the hamburger you get from K Hills versus the size of the Walker Burger King? Because you go to K Hills and you spend a bunch of money and you come out and still hungry, right? 
If any of you ever eaten gay holes. Yeah. You feel a pain there? Yeah. Okay, I, maybe I should have asked any younger drinking gay holes, and then I probably would have got my hands up, you know who you are. Okay. But just so. It's, so these are sort of the, the broad categories here. Farming, restaurants, uh, you know, somebody like Microsoft or somebody like that. But then oligopoly, duopoly, that'd be like the airline industry, the automotive industry, TV networks. Yeah. Where there, there's a handful of people, but there's only a handful of people doing it. Well, this is controlling production or and or distribution. The the selling of it. Maybe you don't make it, but you're controlling the selling of it. Uh, Saddlers in Emporia. Mm, yeah, the kind of we talked about them being a uh, monopsony when it comes to hiring. You work for Saddlers, you don't work. Well, they kind of are a monopoly when it comes to who you can be buying from. Who owns all the businesses in? Businesses in Emporia besides the Walmart. So, yeah, and, that, and that's the fear for Walmart is you know, grocery stores and stores in general are, well, excuse me, they are truly monopolistic competition. You got all these little gas stations, mom and pop stores, and convenience stores, and they are all sort of selling bread and milk and that kind of stuff. But what's the fear is that Walmart and big businesses like that, Walmart and Food Lion and Ammo, are killing off small stores, so we're going from monopolistic competition down to getting into oligopoly territory. So the little businesses are gone, so then you just look with big businesses, and then the fear of the thing I'm getting is that the biggest of big businesses kills the others, and you look with Walmart only. That's, yeah, I'll, I'll leave these words here there. That's fear. We'll talk about that again. Like the later chapter. But if you just brought what we just did the last few minutes, then you're halfway toward getting things for the next three weeks. So, what I've done for each of the categories, I'm making a slide that looks exactly like this for the characteristics, and theoretically, I have them in the same order, the things listed so you can compare and contrast them. So, the examples for perfect competition, and that's where we're going to be for the remainder today and good job of Thursday. Example, farming. Many farmers out there doing their thing. Their products are identical. There's many substitutes. If you go. You know, you can buy my corn, or if you don't want to buy corn from me, you can buy corn from somebody else. There's somebody down the street around the corner, somebody else is growing corn nearby. So you can buy from whoever you want to buy from. There's many people. And it's low barrier sanctuary. We'll talk about these barriers. Barrier is what is a barrier? Yeah. An obstacle, a hurdle. There's very little keeping you from doing. Do you need any you don't need much special equipment? And start growing a few watermelons. You don't need any special equipment. Do you need a license to do it? Do you need to file a patent or anything like that to grow watermelons? It's fairly easy to get into the watermelon business. The company, the farmer, has no market power. You try to do something different, people are going to look at what you're doing and say, I don't think so. Purple corn, Kellogg's is going to ask you to get your truck out of the way. Uh, this is the big ugly. The company is a price taker. These two go together. They have to pay whatever is being, they have to accept whatever the buyer is willing to pay. The buyer is setting a price. And generally, just using the corn and Kellogg's example, that's what happens for a lot of agriculture products. Uh, the, the buyer is going to, we're going to buy and y'all come. Uh, and you, the farmers may not know in advance what they're going to get. Did y'all know in advance what y'all were going to get paid for the corn that y'all took to Tyson? It kind of changed over time. And it changes over time, and you pretty much didn't know until the day that you went over there with a the truckload. He's nodding his head for those of you following along at home. That's what happens. From, so you drive your truckload, and the, I mean, it, it, it's 
almost going to be the case that the loading dock at Kellogg's is going to have a sign there, we're paying $350 a bushel. And if you're okay with taking three fifty bushel, you'll pack your truck up and unload it. If you're not okay with paying three fifty bushel, well, you feel stupid for having driven there in the first place. You drive away because you can't back up and say, "I know the sign says three fifty, but come on, can you give me three sixty? Come on, can you give me four dollars?" They're gonna say, "Get your truck out of the way and let the next serious person unload." The other way a lot of agriculture products are sold is in an auction. Have any of you been in a produce auction? Have you seen tobacco auctions and that kind of stuff? Well, who's driving the price there? The buyers, based on how much you can bid. So hopefully the day you take your cattle to market, you take your tobacco to market, hopefully there's a bunch of buyers there, and hopefully their eyes are starting to dilate and the prices get bid up, 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 up. But if there's only two buyers there and they go through and buy all the wheat, you're not going to collect a whole lot. And in a lot of cases, it's like, well, we've got a bunch of loaded up cows and we've taken them to the market. The last thing we're going to do is stress those animals by taking them back home and then trying to bring them back a few days later. Or the buyers can talk and just say, I can take that, take that for a cheaper price. They always pay a cheaper price. Oh, so uh, the buyers know. trying to negotiate with one another and kind cut of a deal, they could do that. That's, That's why you hopefully different. have more than two buyers in there because it's going to be harder to get three or more to cooperate. Oh. But the farmer is at work. They don't know what they're going to get paid. And it's especially ugly for the farmer because they're starting to plant in the next couple of weeks. First stuff that they're not going to sell until September and they're going to have no clue what the price is. We talked about last semester so the beating that soybean farmers took over soybeans because of that trade war thing thing that President Trump and we're having with China. You know, it started with Trump was saying, well, we're going to raise the prices on uh, tariffs on aluminum and steel that's going to come in. And one of the big people that sells us aluminum and steel is China. And China's like, well, if you're going to nail us on one of the products that y'all buy from us, we're going to nail y'all on a product that we buy from y'all. Soybeans. So the price of soybeans took a better beating. But the farmers had already planted. So it was what it was, and they're like, well, we just hope things clear up before harvest time, and it didn't happen. I dare say we will have a much smaller soybean crop this year. Have y'all thought about changing the land region? I don't know. Oh, okay. yeah. But it just hope that they're talking about maybe by the end of the month they'll have a trade deal, and it's just sort of like wait and see, but the farmers are like, oh, come on, man. I follow agriculture news because it's one of the things I do. And I mean, it's like every day there's articles. The farmers like, come on, y'all, come up with an agreement. We need, we need answers. We need to know. We need to know because they're getting here. It's getting here time to start planting, and we need to know that are we going to have a trade deal, and they're going to buy our soybeans, or are we not? And I need to plant something else instead, more pumpkin. So these two alone, it is hard to be a farmer. You don't have control, you can't change your product, and you can't determine, you have like no say on your price. Because in this case, usually, generally, here's the thing. In pure competition, you're not selling to the end customer. Farmers usually don't sell to the end customer unless they take their products to the farmer's market and put a sign there and then you come and buy it from them. Or if they set out a couple of saw versus a sheet of plywood in their front yard and they put a for sale sign and then you buy from them. Otherwise, most farmers don't sell to the end customer. They'll sell to Kellogg's, it's getting rid of cornflakes. They'll sell it to some wholesaler distributor, somebody that's going to turn around and sell the food line that's going to sell to the end customer. So they don't have control. One nice thing about that is there's no point in a farmer advertising. I'm going to be putting a big billboard out there. Hey, Kellogg's, I'm coming up with a truckload of corn. Oh, no. You know, there's, there's nothing. And you can't say, well, we're better than everybody else. Well, no, you're making the exact same corn as everybody else. You're growing the exact same soybeans as everybody else. So it's not like your soybeans are better than anybody else. There's a number two. Yours is number two. Uh, yeah, unless you're doing like roadside sales. Unless you're doing roadside sales, selling to the end customer, you don't have that control. There's no point in advertising. And it's only if you are going to be selling to the end customer. And that's why farming, 
there, there is a drive in agriculture to try to do things where the farmers do start doing more selling directly to the customer, trying to get whatever they can do to get people to come to the farm and buy products, doing an agritourism thing, like what Carrie's family does. They have the parish pumpkin patch. If any of y'all been to that, probably one of you. That's depressing. Usually I get a bunch of hand, hands up in the area and like, okay, that's not. Uh, but a lot of people go out there and they go out there and you know they're going to court maize and they're seeing pumpkins and they're shooting apples into the thing in the field. And the, they used to have a vein out there. Where, where, Y'all just destroyed our sound, huh? Destroyed it. Yes. Uh, but so, but while you're there, you can buy a pumpkin and take it home and carve it up and so you got your jack o' lantern for Halloween. And they've got other stuff, including long dead glass bottles of sun drop in the bar. So, um, they have you know, t shirts and that kind of stuff. Um, it's a way to get people out there on a farm and get people to pay full price for the farm. You can pay the same for a pumpkin in their pumpkin patch as you would pay it food line. But when you buy it from them at the pumpkin patch, the farmer's getting all 100% of the money. Or if you buy the food line, the food line is pocketing 40% of the money right there. The distributor that food line bought the pumpkin from is getting another 30%. The farmer's only getting a quarter as opposed to the whole thing. So any kind of thing for agritourism to try to get people out of there, there's a thing, what, like, uh, it, there was a workshop, it, well, it's been rescheduled twice, it's going to be in Hughesville soon. It's a farm to restaurant thing, partnerships between restaurants and farms. We got farm fresh ingredients, because we partner with local farms, and so the veg, the salad, the lettuce that's going to be on your salad today was in the field this morning. Right? And people are like, dude, fresh ingredients, and they're all about that. We're partnering up with and trying to eliminate as many of the middle people in the process as possible. We're doing that at Black Sun Food Line with some of our produce. We have like the Food Line brand on one side, and we have like local brands on the other side that come directly to our store. They, they made a deal with corporate to come directly to our store and sell their products. Yeah, that's like Milton's own, I think it is a meat. Place and beef thing in Emporia does kind of there. You know, they've got partnerships now with I think it's Food Line, and they're selling a handful of. And that's a beautiful thing. But what? But barring anything like that, we're not selling to the end customer. They're being appointed and advertising. How many do you know what farm your last hamburger came from? Do you know what state the cow from your last hamburger came from? Some of you might know what I know is Angus. That's it. That's it. We we don't know. A lot of the customers don't care, so they're no point in advertising because there ain't no point. Yeah. So it's the only reason they only sell to end customers because they don't think they're gonna sell their entire stuff like they can't do away. That's part of it. Good question. Um and, there, and it depends on what it is you're growing too. Like, how many of us buy, buy soybeans? Have any, ever gone, have any of you ever bought soybeans? Any of you ever bought wheat? No, we don't go to the store and buy bags of wheat. No, those are ingredients that have, are being used to making soy sauce or bread or that kind of stuff. So, tofu flavor. Oh, uh, the yeah, that, that, those are pure commodity making ingredient making things. But think like farmers growing tomatoes and that kind of stuff. Yeah, we buy tomato. So we go with you. Uh, but so those farmers, you know, they have a chance to do it, but then they have to have somebody manning the table all day, every day. So if that farmer is out there working the table, what are they not doing? Out there in the field. So suddenly the farmer's going to have to hire somebody else to do the selling for them. And who knows when, all how long these tomatoes are going to get sold. Where a lot of times, yeah, we may not get as much money if we sell somebody else. We sell them all, all at one time. So they can't, it, part of the thing selling individually to the end customer is their costs are going to go up. So it, it's a balance there. Um, I've never seen this here while I was over in Japan. I've noticed a lot of like local farmers that grew fruit and vegetables and stuff would have like this box out in front of their house and just have produce out there and they would have a list of um, what cost what and they I mean it was kind of like an honor system type thing but you just put in the money for whatever you took. Oh. And 
because of the culture there, I mean, yeah, pretty much everybody would be honest, but I don't want to tell we're here. I didn't know they might be like that. That is ringing such a bell. I've never I've seen that. Think about the dude face ringing bells over. Was that the best kind of thing? Yeah. It wasn't it, but yeah, it was okay. But but no, I just saw something about somebody said it sounds like something about selling out the honor system this is day or two ago when I was dead father and how they got. But part of it is Japan, you know, geographically a lot closer together. But how many of y'all are gonna like, well I'm, let's go to Dundas and get a pumpkin. Let's go to Dundas and get a half cut of two or three tomatoes. Back when I was growing up when I was a kid. It used to be, yeah, the, you know, my mother, she had the grocery day, and she dragged us kids along. Yeah. And then a, a old lady who lived on the farm in one of the other houses, she'd go along. And she'd, hey, where am I going? And do they go to the food world? Now it's part of the Paris theater. Yeah. But, you know, they go to the grocery store, they go down the street, they go to the produce thing, and, you know, they go there and they get the, you know, pick up the whatever vegetable stuff. Go, yeah, actually, the milk was delivered to the house, because then you still used to have them. Yeah, in the 70s. No. I know I'm young, but I did still. But yes, but just even as late as that, you could still hide in the middle of nowhere. The, the, the dairies would be bringing milk coming around and that kind of stuff. So you had the, we get the milk directly from the dairy. We get the produce directly from the produce thing, thing just getting it directly from farmers. We get go to the grocery store to get the stuff that you couldn't get from the vegetable, the produce stand, and the, 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 the dairy. But now we, the consumers are like one style shopping. I want to go to one place and get it all. And so that's why we've had such a rise in grocery stores, big grocery stores, and why the little things have gone away. You know, did y'all know the dairies used to deliver milk to the house? Of course, y'all didn't know that. Okay, a couple of y'all did. Well, I saw it on TV. Tom and Jerry. Tom and Jerry. Something yes. just, okay. okay. And that is an acceptable way to have learned that. Yes. Okay. And that's the second time I've heard something about Tom and Jerry in the last 24 or 48 hours. That's coming home pretty long. I'm having just flashbacks. Speaking of uh, milk deliveries, though, again, about uh, Japan, like if you wanted milk, you would have to go to your like, local corner store and uh, order. You have to tell the person in front, like, hey, I want milk this day. And they would have like a couple bus bottles reserved for you whenever it got delivered. Okay. But it wouldn't be delivered like to keep on shelves. Yeah. And part of that is space is such a premium in Japan that they're like, we're not going to have a bunch of extra milk on a shelf sitting around. Maybe we sell it. Maybe we're not because it's expensive to produce, it's expensive to store. It's because yeah, it was a lot more expensive. So they're like, if you want your milk, that's fine. But give us a couple days notice and we'll get it here and there doing. Just in time delivery for you business people. Just in time inventory for you milk in the store. I had thought about it, but it didn't make sense there. This is the profit maximizing rule. I'm 99% sure I have a slide that talks about this. The company is going to produce at the point where the price that they make is equal to the marginal cost to produce. Because at that point, they've gotten all the money out of this thing that they can. If their cost, marginal cost is less than the price, they're going to keep producing more, and keep producing more, and keep producing more, until uh, their costs rise, they'll catch up the price, then they're going to stop. If their price is Lower than our marginal cost. Well, okay, we produce too much. We can slow down. We can slow down and slow down. We lower our costs until we get right back to that point. Um, okay, I, I do have slides for that, so I'm just trying to decide. This is just the introduction. But we'll revisit this. A little bit, but this is going to be their rule: produce for a price is equal to marginal cost. Oh, I, I've got slides on that, but I can talk about it. So, this is farming in a nutshell. Crack that nutshell open a little bit. 
I already talked about some of this. I went into more detail on that last slide than you probably should have. So, okay, this will be bad. Since there's so many people doing what it is that you're doing, no producer has market power. Remember what we were talking about? Y'all getting mad at me and complaining to me because I was running the coal mine. And any one of you complain, I tell you to shut up and get out because y'all are one out of many of my workers. And getting rid of you and hiring a replacement is just a mere steep up. Same thing for a farmer. You're such a small player compared to the overall market that it's not a problem if we make you mad. It's not a problem if you're not happy with the price that we're going to pay you because there's tons of other people doing the exact same work. They're willing to take that price because it's either that they take that price or they get nothing. You can, okay. You can take the three dollars we're paying for your corn, or you can go away, and then that corn should be sitting in the back of your truck, slowly rotting. And then whatever price it may be, uh, you hold on that corn for a week, and then you come back here, and you'd be willing to sell it to me if you bid it to start to fall apart, right? So they have no control over the price that they charge. So ultimately, for the individual company, the individual farm, the demand curve they're facing is flat because they're just a big player. Kellogg's buys millions and millions and millions of tons of corn. You come rolling up with two tons worth, that's two out of the, I don't know, 30 million that they're buying. So they're just gonna say, how much corn do you have? Unload it. You got two tons, bring it on. You got three tons, bring it on. You got five tons, bring it on. We're gonna buy all that you want, all that you got, and we're going to keep buying all the corn that's coming in until we bought our year supply of corn. And then we don't have to buy anymore. So for the individual company, this is what their demand curve is. The individual farm, this is their demand curve for corn, for soybeans, or whatever it is. When Carrie's family, when they hauled the soybeans down to Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, two weeks ago. I mean, today, we could. Oh, you took some today? Well, uh, anyway, y'all, well, he, they were loading up the truck the day that we had to test. We didn't have to. That's why you just, like, oh, yeah. right, like, but, so, yeah, they load up, and they go down there, and they, 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 they were just, you know, uh, they were told what the price is, and then they probably drove the truck up on the scales, and they weighed the truck, unloaded, and then they drove the truck back on the scales and see what it weighed, and somebody did a little bit of math, and boom. But they're not going to say, oh, it looks like you got it, you know, Two tons there, well, we're going to pay you three and a quarter instead of three, because y'all got more of that. Oh. It's just, this is the price we're paying. How much you got? I think it's too low like, quality, like moisture level. You know? It's yeah. too wet. They don't, they don't prefer it, so they don't pay as much for it. So you got to kind of get it right before you take it over. there. Yeah. I, I'm, really, I'm trying to simplify things, but what Carrie's getting to is corn is graded for quality. Or soybeans, all, all your agriculture products are graded on quality. And so they're going to have a different price for did it grade? I can't remember the names of it. Oh, I'm blanking out on the names of the quality grades for the, the, I'm trying not to look at the slide. But the, like for beef, prime, choice, standard, cutter, you see seen those? And that's based on how tender it is, how much. Fat, the inner muscular marbling is what we call it, the fat inside the meat for the juiciness and flavor and that kind of stuff. So they're going to look at your meat and they're going to decide, is it prime, is it choice, is it standard? And then based on that, this is the price we charge. For soybeans and things like that, they're looking at moisture levels, how much non-bean stuff is in there with beans. Because when you go in there with a combine, you chop it up and suck the beans out, you get some junk in there too, stalks and bean pod shells and stuff. So they look at those kind of things, grade it out, and they just have this chart. You grade number one, this is what we're paying. You grade number two, this is what we're paying. You grade number three, this is what we're paying. We grade you and hey, take your price and we unload. So we try to target your delivery based on the quality of your products because soybeans, every day that they're out of the field, they're going to do what? Dry out a little bit. The cow, every day it's on the field, it's on its feet walking around, it gains more weight. Good. But it gains more muscle, which is much weight, which is kind of good. But they end up burning up fat. The older the cow, there's less of that marbling, 
and meat goes from being crying to now it's going to be kind of tough when you crack it up in this hamburger meat and ain't nobody getting a whole lot. Right? So the older cows end up being less fat, tougher meat, they break lower. So you got to strike that balance. So we want our cows to be old enough, they put out a bunch of muscle, but young enough that it's still juicy muscle. Right? So there's still has to be like old cows. Um, well, I mean, there, there's young cows get great poorly, but most of the cows, if you if a cow is more than a year old, it's probably going to end up being hammered because that's sort of the target date is for the cow to go to market when it's one year old. If you're going to be prime and you're becoming in choice, one year old, all year old dairy cows, hammer bulls, hammer, and your old beef cows that you know, produce a bunch of babies, hammer. That's where they go. Your prime steak when you go and you you spend twenty some odd dollars at Outback or something like that for a good prime steak. When you're old, still cute. Never got a driver's license. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, cow with a driver's license. Okay. So the individual firm the demand is flat. The industry the demand curve is now really sloping because Kellogg's going to be looking and they're going to be saying, well. If there's and it is derived demand from the demand for cornflakes. If not many people want cornflakes, we looking to buy a bunch of corn. If a lot of people want cornflakes, we're going to be buying more corn. But overall, what ends up driving thing is when the price is high for corn because it's like a drought or something like that. The price is high for corn. If the farmers are they're going to be like. Yo, Kellogg's can't 100% well, we're going to screw y'all and every year we're only going to pay $2 a bushel ha 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 and you're going to get up because they have to uh, the, the farmers have to make some profit or have to at least cover their costs through the farmers are going to go out of business and then who are they buying corn from next year? Nobody. Then what happens to Corn Flakes next year? Nothing. So what happens to Kellogg's? G-O-N gone. Right? So they have to be looking at the industry as a whole and they do. And they see well, if for some reason there ain't as much corn being produced because of storms, tornadoes, hurricanes, whatever, the supply for corn is back here somewhere, which means that the price of corn is high. Well, corn is high, which means the price of cornflakes is going to be higher this year. We ain't going to sell as much cornflakes. We ain't going to buy as much. But if the price of corn is low because we had a good crop and that kind of stuff, the buy a bunch of corn. And they'll make cornflakes until cows come home, and they'll take some of that corn and they'll store it up for next year, and that kind of thing. They'll work things out. So, the industry as a whole, the demand curve is downwardly sloping, but for each, each individual farmer, it's flat. So, the farmer. The demand curve is flat. They can't change their product. They can't change their price. There ain't no point in advertising to tell people, hey, we're better than they are, so y'all don't buy from us instead of buying from somebody else. So what does the farmer do? The farmer only has one option, one decision, and that is how much am I going to grow? When I'm getting into soybeans, the question is, is how many soybeans am I going to plant? How much corn am I going to plant? How much watermelon am I going to plant? I'm going to plant it in hopes that I'm going to make the money that I think I'm going to make when the fall comes around. That is your only decision. How much am I going to plant? And the answer is not as much as humanly possible. Many farmers do make that mistake of, well, it's going to be selling three dollars a bushel. Well, the more bushels that I can carry, the more money I'm going to walk away with. You can't just blindly say, I'm going to crank out as much corn as humanly possible. Because you're not going to buy it. Because maybe not, it's not all going to get bought. And if you're growing all that you can, I'm growing all I can, they're growing all they can, she's growing all she can, he's growing all he can, guess what? There's a crap ton of corn out there, so what still aren't you going to be thinking? Oh, the price. There's a crap ton of corn out there, so guess what? Lower the price. So you just did a whole lot more work and end up bringing home a whole lot less money. So the ultimate decision is to find out what is the right 
amount to produce to where we will get the most money that we can. And this is a short term decision based on where you are right now. There's a word here that I haven't used. If I want to take a guess of what word I should have been dancing around. Begins with the word scene, the letter scene. No. Shorter. Cost. Got to think like your costs. That's going to be dictating how much is the right amount to produce. Based on the tractors you have now, the buildings you have now, the trucks you have now, workers. the workers you have now, the chainsaws you have now, whatever, based on that, and based on your best guess as to what the current price is going to be, you have to use that information to make a decision. Because if you already had a combine, it carries out. They already have the combine that they used to get up sort of beans. The harvester. So guess what? They can't say, well, let me take a year off. They still gotta pay for that piece of equipment, right? So they got kind of got two options. Number one, sell that piece of equipment and get out of soybean game, or number two, dang it, well, we need to plant some more soybeans. So based on the short the long term is but do we want to get out of soybeans and grow more or grow more pumpkins so we can get rid of that harvest and get rid of all of that? That's a long term decision. But based on what we have now, what we're gonna keep now, where are we at now? How much is the right amount of produce? See, any decision you could make back and bite you in the butt that could come back and bite you in the butt because in the short term if you're thinking well if I have this right now and I could plant um, soybeans but the like the market for soybeans is really really low this year like it was this past year but if you were thinking long term you could go well maybe corn's gonna go up considering um, well, I guess it's going to go up in certain soybeans are going to come down. But if you think long term, you think that somehow polls are going to go up and you just sell all your soybeans. Yeah, that, that, and that's what you do. You look at the long term. And that's sort of, we danced around this with Sam and his car Ubering thing. thing. If, you know, okay, soybean farmers, they, they took a beating this last year. But if they think overall, four years out of five, we're going to make good money. You can stick in the game, but if you like, well, I think four years out of five are going to get shafted, well, then yeah, you start looking at selling off the soybean equipment and start to raise cow. Or, you know, switch the gear. But you got to take a long term view, but you can't ignore those short term costs right now. Though. I got to make pay. Um, and so you got to take that long term view. If you, in the get going, that's what the carrots like his family, they haven't figured out what they're going to do yet. They know they've got the harvester, they know they've got their expenses, they know they got their equipment. But they're waiting to see if it looks like this trade war with China is going to be over and things should improve. Yeah, we're going to go out and plant soybeans. But if it looks like by the end of the month, if you know, the Chinese ambassador, the American ambassador get in this fight somewhere and that kind of thing, it looks like you know, okay, trade war and that kind of stuff, then they may go, oh, okay, it's going to be ugly for the next few years, let's sell this equipment and move on. And do something different, and then maybe five years from now, when it is conditions improve, we can buy a used piece of equipment and get back into the working plan. It kind of sucks to have to worry about politics when you're a farmer, I guess. Yes, it really does. And, and that's it. We, uh, uh, last year I took a bunch of agricultural students to the Governor's Conference on Agricultural Trade in Richmond. Uh, it was during spring break. I did, couldn't get up a group to go this year, but last year, this is when a trade war thing started to happen hijack the entire conversation because the, the whole day we're i mean the only thing that happened was the increased hair on steel and aluminum but everybody there was like that they're going to retaliate against agriculture because that's the number one thing that far that china buys from us is agriculture products and so they're like they're going to retaliate against us so we have like the not sunny Purdue, but what they just the, uh, yeah, Sunday Purdue, the Secretary of Agriculture, he was there. And then, it's, uh, ironically enough, we also had the, one of the Purdue guys, the head of Purdue Chicken Company. They were, and the, everybody's asking questions about what's it, what's with the trade? With How's this going to work out? Where do y'all think we're going to get hit? We had the, there was like a, a Canadian, a Mexican, and American trade representative was there because guess what was the other thing they were doing? 
throwing out NAFTA and doing the USMCA thing. That hadn't, that hadn't really hit yet, but there was a little bit of talk about that. So everybody's like, what's going to happen? What do y'all think is going to happen? How are we going to get hurt? What, that, that was the whole conversation for the whole time. We had the agenda, the list of topics. Went over none of it. That's what everybody was worried about. And yeah, you know, kind of stinks if you're a small farmer out right here in the middle of nowhere and you're worried about something from halfway around the planet. But it is what it is. So the only choice as a farmer is how much am I going to produce? And it ain't as simple as I'm going to blindly produce as much as humanly possible as I suggested. To maximize your income, yeah, you plan as much as you can. But you're not in it to plan and maximize income. What do you need to maximize? Profit. So that's why you have to factor costs in. Revenue or income, that's just a price time quantity. If you if three dollars a bushel, if you do one hundred bushels, you bring in three hundred dollars. If you do two hundred bushels, you bring in six hundred dollars. Right? It's just straight flat. But you're not in it to maximize your income, you're in it to maximize for profit, so I think I have this big one on the next. Yes. So you have to consider your profits, and you got to consider how increasing your production is going to impact your costs. Because remember, fixed costs, variable costs, a variable cost thing. Each bushel, extra bushel of corn you plant is going to cost you extra seed, extra fertilizer, extra water, extra labor, extra gasoline in truck period there. The extra cost for every extra bushel that you produce. But you have to bear in mind what I could have read. You have to bear in mind what I already hinted at. You got to pay the harvester payment anyway. Right. Your fixed costs still be there. So you can't just say, well, I'm going to plant nothing. But then I have no variable costs. Well, then you don't have any money to pay your fixed costs like pay your house payment, pay your property tax, that kind of thing. But you have to pay your fixed costs. And keep in mind, your variable costs go up. The variable costs and your fixed costs together. Remember this from three weeks ago? Of course not. Uh, your cost curve goes up like this. Sometimes it's going up fast, sometimes it's going up slow, sometimes it's going up fast again. This is the you're getting started, you buy that first thing of eggs, first thing of sugar, first thing of flour, bacon cakes, remember that. But then this is when you've got so many cooks in the kitchen that they're stepping on each other, they're walking on each other, you try to stack cakes on top of one another inside the same oven, and then you're paying everybody overtime and that kind of stuff. You don't want to be playing in either of those two areas. You ultimately want to be working somewhere in this region, right? Kind of. This is, oh God, what five minutes. Visually, Put the two together. The green line is revenue, red line is costs. Here, you're doing what? You're losing money, right? Your costs are greater than your revenue. This point is what? This is your break even. At that point, you have made enough money, income to cover all your costs. But you don't want to do that. What are you doing out here? You're making profit. So you want to be somewhere in this zone. Where in this zone do you want to be? Yeah. You want to be right here, where the difference between your income and your costs is the biggest. Because this is the amount of profit you get, and your profit is bigger here than it is anywhere else. Over here, you get a big profit. Over here, your costs are increasing again, you're paying overtime, all that stuff, you only get a little bit of profit. But here, you're getting more profit anywhere else. So guess what? That, my friends, is how much soy beans you should plant. If you plant less than that, okay, you're making profit, but not as much as you could have. If you plant more than that, you start chewing into that profit that you would have been making. You end up making less profit for doing more work. If you would have done a little bit less work, you would have brought home more money. Right. That sounds kind of common to it. Sense. Yeah. So, a labeling. Yeah, your profit area and your loss area. And visually, I just saw uh, these are these are made up numbers from the example. 
Oh, I'm, like I'm losing my grip. Uh, in this case, I think I have a numerical example on a later slide that we'll see on Thursday. If the fire does less than 165 bushels, they're going to lose money. But if they get up to 165, they can start making money. And they'll make more profit, more profit, more profit until 300. If they go to 301, they start losing some of their profit. They're making profit, not as much. Joseph. I have a dollar bill. Pretend. I have a dollar bill. Will you give me a quarter for it? At trade number one, she did a deal. Trade number two, I have another dollar. Will you give me 50 cents for it? She'll do that trade. It ain't as good as the first one, but she still made extra money from it, right? So she wants, she's, she's going to do it. Not as profitable as the first one, but she went from making only 25 cent profit and now she's made 75 cents profit off my stupidity, right? I know she wants to make a 50 cent profit for 75 cents. What, whatever that number is worth. I know she went from 75 to a bucket and a quarter. There we go. Man, let me try it. So, wait, okay, Josie, deal number three. Did you give me 90 cents and I'll give you a dollar? Just go do that, you yeah. know? She only made 10 cents profit, but what's happening? She's making even more profit. She just went from, she went from here, now she's here. Okay, Josie, deal number four. You give me 99 cents, I give you a dollar. Yeah, it's only a penny, but that's an extra penny more profit than she would have had before. Okay, trade number five. You give me a dollar, I give you a dollar. What's the point? Unless you're looking at the serial number and trying to figure out which one's got a better poker hand for any of y'all playing dollar poker. Unless it's the first dollar. No. Okay, now question. Okay, trade number six. So, okay, she's probably not going to do trade number five, but she got these to her, so okay. So, okay, trade number six. You give me a dollar and a quarter, and I give you a dollar. She ain't going to do that. But if she did do that, what happened? She would have lost a little bit of the profit that she already made, but she still made, she made 75 cents on that first deal, 50 cents on that she already pulled, She already suckered me out of a couple dollars worth of profit, and then going a little bit farther cost her a little bit of that profit, but she still has money ahead, right? So the farmer can still be money ahead if they keep going and keep going, but they should worry about it. Next trade, you give me two dollars, I give you a dollar, and you can do it as she did for just one main pension. And then we can do a couple more trades. Suddenly, she's right back into having the same amount of money that she had to begin with. And then I'm hoping she ain't paying attention. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna start jumping over. Right. So what do we have here? This is a backwards. Break even point. It ain't got, it doesn't have an ink. It's a backwards break even point. This is where she gained money and then lost all that extra money she gained and she's right back in even again. And if she goes beyond there, she starts to lose again. Yeah, because she, she went from two steps forward, one step back, one step forward, two steps back, and then she got right back to where she started from, right? And then she can, but the trend keeps going, right? So she'll, eventually she'll hit another yes. break even above that. Yes, in reality, which we talked about before. Yeah, it's going to keep doing this kind of thing. As she buys the second oven, then she's got two ovens instead of one that gives her a whole oven. Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's the counter for it here. So she, she either needs to play in this area or buy a second oven and then she can play in this area. Whole different category. Or she can get a third oven and start playing out there again. So there's gaps in between that she doesn't want to be in. But right now, given the fact that she has one oven, she wants to be here. If she wants to do anything other than here, she needs to, you know, the whole new reality of the second oven, the second tractor, a third oven, a third tractor, but she wants to be in here and not just in here. And I'm sorry for all you all following along at home with all this, but she wants to be right here, get the most that she can out of the oven that she has, the tractor that she has, the chainsaw that she has, right? That's the target. So it ain't just we the farmer are gonna grow as much as we can. There's the right number for the farmers to do, but a lot of farmers don't do the math. They don't know what their costs are. They haven't sit there, done the homework and that kind of stuff, but they just blindly, well, we're just finding every acre that we can. And they don't realize that maybe a little bit of less work would have given them a lot more profit. 
That's the only decision that they have. They've got to figure out, do the math, what is it? Do the math, figure out what is this target, and then try to hit that target. And then let the chips fall where they may, and hope that during the time that crop is in field, that the price of soybeans doesn't change. Or turn it over. Okay, hope it doesn't change for the negative. Y'all with me? Okay, so if nothing else, hug a farmer and thank them. And ask them if they have any stuff that you can buy directly to them. Otherwise, I will see you on Thursday. And have a good afternoon.